Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Well, guys, we're going to start with Florence. Do you know this monster is generating waves that have been measured at 83 feet high out at sea right now? It's basically moving at 15 miles an hour northwesterly and is going to slow down. And it looks like it's going to hammer the Carolinas as a Category 4 or Category 3 hurricane. So right at landfall, the, the wind should be somewhere around 130 miles an hour. Currently, there's gusts up to 165 miles an hour. And things have changed as far as what the prolonged outlook is. It, it's definitely going to be a huge rainmaker. Yet, when we were looking last night, and we had a, a great live uh, show last night, it was wonderful. I hope you guys will check that out. Lots of great observations, lots of great calls in from, from subscribers. And we were talking all about this, but last night we were looking at basically an impact in over the Outer Banks and then just sitting there for a while and then kind of drifting up the East Coast. Well, that that's all changed and, and this could change quite a bit. As we see right now, winds 130, barometric pressure is at 943 millibars, moving northwest at 15 miles an hour. 83 foot waves, that is just amazing. Amazing. And this will likely be, as it's underlined, the storm of a lifetime for portions of the Carolina coast. Unprecedented flooding. And the numbers are staggering, the numbers that they're talking about. They're talking about areas getting upwards of 40 inches of rain. And here is the forecast, forecast path right now. Comes in, and then it kind of dips down and heads into South Carolina. And again, this can change. So basically it's looking a little bit different than it was looking before. Uh, people in South Carolina, keep, keep your eyes open, keep aware of all this. Here's your storm surge. 9 to 13 feet in the Wilmington area. As we can see, Myrtle Beach, 6 to 9 feet down towards Est Edisto, 2 to 4 feet. Up at Cape Hatteras, 4 to 6. Tropical storm force wind probability going all the way out into the mountains of uh, western North Carolina and uh, very easternmost Tennessee even and on up into Virginia as well and some of the fringes of West Virginia through Georgia as well. Very, very possible. Um, you know, this, this thing is going to linger. This, it's going to linger, unfortunately. And look at these rainfall totals. This is the outlook through Monday. Areas around Wilmington localized up to 40 inches. 40 we've been talking about it being like Harvey um, but the thing is the winds could be more damaging than what Harvey's were so you you should have the catastrophic flooding that we had with Harvey uh, and actually probably more wind damage than we did and so this is something most definitely to watch out for a big buzz last night was to talk about the nuclear power plants so two of them are right in the path of Hurricane Florence, and of course nobody wants a Fukushima, uh, to be sure. And the first one is the Brunswick Station, which is really pretty much directly in the path. And the Harris Nuclear Plant is, is a little bit further inland. Um, it's, it is predicted to pass over the Brunswick plant. And as you see, the Harris one is in New Hill, which is about 23 miles away from Raleigh. So more than likely, that one shouldn't be as much of an issue as the Brunswick plant. Prevailing winds are usually from the west, typically, you know, blowing in an easterly direction. And that's something to think about when you're talking about the nuclear power plants. And according to who you're talking to, most experts will say if anything is ever going wrong, you want to be at least 50 miles away from them, if not 200 or more. So it is something to, again, be aware of. And just so you can see, these are um, US operating commercial nuclear power reactors. And there's a lot on the East Coast. And actually all the way up, you see there's tons of them up in PA and New York State, through New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, 
and then the, there are some in the Carolinas as well. So the ones on the coast here are the ones that we're concerned about, especially right here. And so right now, let's take a look at NOAA. And so this is the newest, newest info from 11 a.m. And Air Force Hurricane Hunter aircraft finds Florence has changed little while moving towards the U.S. southeast coast. Life-threatening storm surge and rainfall is expected across portions of the Carolinas. And we were looking at some of these different uh, maps there as well. This is the earliest reasonable arrival of tropical storm force winds. So basically Thursday 8 a.m. should start to have the tropical storm force winds hitting the Carolinas. And uh, going on in Thursday at 8 p.m. all the way into South Carolina. And then feeling the effects of it Friday 8 a.m. on up through the mountains of North Carolina and into Georgia. And as we were, we were looking before, you could see the way the path has been. And so what, what's going to be the final approach? You know, there's a lot of strong uh, upper level winds going on. If we look at some of the uh, spaghetti models here, you can see they are pretty much in pretty good agreement. You have a couple of random ones that are shooting down actually into Georgia. But for the most part now, and this is different because if we looked at them yesterday, it was coming in and then riding upwards, straight upwards. Now it's, it's dipping down and inland and shooting on up. And, you know, you know, depending on what the circumstances are, you know, it, it could be very tough on the people that are inland, depending on how fast it moves. Pittsburgh has been going through the PA, Western PA has had so much flooding in, in the past week or two. It's been intense flooding, so not something that they want to see more, more of coming on in. And of course the Carolinas are going to have so much going on. And, you know, right now Right now we're looking at 130 uh, mile an hour steady winds with 165 mile an hour gusts. And uh, as it gets online, you know, going on shore, it should dissipate some, but it's still gonna be strong. And so here we're at Ventusky, and we have the G GFS model right now. This is current. Let's take it out to tomorrow approaching on Thursday into Friday there you go Friday right on the shore and as you can see just basically a little bit northeast of Wilmington strongest winds again are on the northeast quadrant and so what we're looking at is about 118 look to be about as, as strong as I've seen it's going to be a significant storm, probably Category 3 at landfall, or possibly still Category 4. Then we go into Saturday, and it doesn't really move much. It's centered just a little bit to the southwest of Wilmington, just piling on with the rain and the storm surge going on in through. We go into Sunday, it jumps down basically due north of Charleston, South Carolina. Now the winds have died way down, but you still have a huge rainmaker. You're still having tons of rain going into the same area here from Jacksonville to Wilmington. And then when we jump into Monday, it shifts inland quite a bit. And this is, this is a big change. And here it's actually centered around Clemson, uh, South Carolina, Anderson, Clemson. Again, it's not going to be a windmaker at this point, not really. Um, 20s mostly what we're having in here. But rain, definitely rain. And then going into Tuesday, it jumps northward and uh, actually moves rapidly up to around uh, Cleveland. <laughs> so this has been changing. Every time I look at it, it changes a little bit. So the, the bottom line is, let's keep our eyes on it as it approaches 
definitely a dangerous situation for anybody in the Carolinas. And also potentially for others in other areas as well. So we have lava flow seen on a restless Alaskan volcano. And this is Mount Viyaminov. Viyaminov. And uh, this is in Alaska. Scientists say satellite images obtained Sunday show lava flow is about one half mile long on the 8,225 foot volcano, which is one of Alaska's most active. And so the the observatory last week increased the threat level from yellow to orange. This means it has the potential to send ash above 20,000 feet, which could threaten some international airplanes. And there's actually quite a bit of volcanic activity going on right now. As uh, we know, we have experienced a lot of it. Eruptions at, at Vyamenov, as we were saying, up in Alaska. Uh, Karamansky in Russia, Cherry Alba in Costa Rica, Krakatau in Indonesia, and still some ongoing at Kilauea, though Kilauea is basically pretty quiet right now. So volcanic activity, as we've been saying, is, is just running right along. And if we uh, take a good look right now at what's going on uh, volcano-wise, you see a ton of activity. So the red's an eruption, and the yellow is a minor eruption. And as we can see, it's very active out there. Very, very active. And that's what we expect to happen now. So, you know, this is just stuff that didn't usually happen normally, and it's happening all the time now. Taxi driver drowned on Saturday in flash floods, and he's been identified. And this is out of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. And we saw that young mother and her uh, little one that died in floods down in Texas. You know, it's, it's, it's wild and crazy, but this is what we have now. The, the situation has totally changed, and it doesn't really matter whether you're on the coast or inland. The flooding situation is something we have to all be aware of. And especially if you're driving, again, you know, make sure that you're being extra extra safe because, you know, it might be an area that floods on a regular basis. You've been through this area all your life. You think it's no big deal, but the times are different. The storms are different. The intensity is different. And, you know, right there on Main Street, Main Street, USA, you could end up having a flash flood now that will cause your death of drowning it's it's kind of crazy to think about it in so many areas where this might never have been a problem before but with the amount of rain that we're getting in just short short amounts of time it's just it's something we all need to be aware of no matter where we live here they had over three inches of rain and it was a new daily rainfall record for that day breaking the record of 1.67 inches about almost half as much, which was way back in 1876. So can we, can we say unprecedented in our times? Because that's what we have. So be very safe, be very aware of your surroundings, and be very aware of the potential. So can carbon carbon 14 dating link Exodus with a cataclysmic volcanic eruption? And apparently so. In the mid-2nd millennium B.C., between 1650 and 1500 B.C., there was a cataclysmic volcanic eruption which devastated the Mediterranean, Mediterranean island of Thera, which is now Santorini, and launched volcanic rock as far as Greenland. Greenland. That's a hell of an eruption. Mediterranean to Greenland. Wow. Wow. That event was one of the largest volcanic eruptions in Earth's recorded history. I mean, do we realize that these things can happen and we're in a period of increased activity, you know, which is completely something that we have not seen the likes of in our lifetimes at all. So that that's pretty amazing. You know, imagine that, shooting rock all the way from the Mediterranean up to Greenland. So the cryptic nature of the Thera eruption has given rise to many theories on the matter, from the cause of the fall of the legendary Society of Atlantis, 
to an explanation of the plagues visited upon the Egyptians in ex Exodus and even the parting of the Red Sea. While these theories remain largely unproven, it's been long suggested that an accurate dating of the Thera eruption may solidify other floating or unattributable dates from the surrounding regions. In an article published in the journal Science Advancements, Advances called Annual Radiocarbon Record indicates 16th century BCE date for the Thera eruption. A team led by dendrochronologist or tree ring expert Dr. Charlotte Pearson sought to refine the carbon-14 dating process. Currently, the process can only date samples to within a span of decades, but Dr. Pearson hopes this new method can date samples to a specific year. So what we're trying to do is be part of a global realization that radiocarbon calibration method is ready for an improvement because of the technological advances. So it, it just, it's very, very interesting to see how some of these historic and legendary events can all be linked together again to climate change you know and climate change that is something that man has no no input in uh, it's just basically a part of what's going on in the bigger cycles of things now I think there's a lot of input from man in our our world now in many negative ways but again you know the earth the sun, they are so much more powerful than we. So interesting, because some of the biblical stories could be tied into this eruption. And so, really bad news for New Zealand. The destructive earthquake is overdue along the Alpine Fault. And the Alpine Fault runs about 500 kilometers up the western side of the South Island. And scientists say evidence shows the tectonic plate has produced a magnitude 8.1 rupture roughly every three centuries over the past 8,000 years. And the last quake of that magnitude was back in 1717, so it's been basically 300 years, and it rocked the area so hard it shifted its southern side by eight meters in a few seconds. Wow, 24 feet in just a few seconds. And of course, with everything that we have going on right now, you almost has to have to say, you know, how is it not going to go at some point in, in our relatively soon future with all the tectonic movement that's going on, all the stresses that are, are being placed on the planet. We have seen wild fissures open up in so many different places, you know, tremendous cracks in the earth, sinkholes in places that you don't always see sinkholes. Uh, of course, we've had mega quakes that are so deep, they, they just are so out of the norm. If we look at everything right now, it looks uh, kind of quiet, especially on the southern half here of the Ring of Fire. Nothing really happening at the moment down through South America, or Australia, or Indonesia. We just have one over here at 5.1. We do have some activity down through Central America, 5.3 Nicaragua. 4.8 Mexico, 4.3 El Salvador, quite a bit going on on the uh, Caribbean plate. One unusual one up in Pennsylvania, a 1.7, so it's, it's very small, but still it's in an interesting spot in southeastern Pennsylvania. Quite a bit of activity going on out west, nothing really large. Swarming up in Alaska as usual, and again, nothing really large so taking a look over here so 911 season 2 trailer a giant earthquake splits LA in half but it's okay Jennifer Love Hewitt is here so predicted programming and we've talked about this a million times is it people tapping into the collective consciousness is it orchestrated is it just coincidental is, is it nothing at all so it's interesting that they have this as a topic of the show. And it's also interesting because that's exactly what I had a dream of back in March. It was literally, LA was split right down in two. Exactly. Um, very interesting. So you could go ahead and watch the official trailer and see what you guys think. I know a lot of you have, have had these type of premonitions and dreams.
as well. Winter is coming early to Kazakhstan. Weather warnings issued. A mix of rain, snow, fog, frost, icy winds, unusually cold nights are all forecast to hit parts of Kazakhstan this week. So, you know, we're, we're going to be jumping pretty much from summer to winter in, in so many places. And I remember over the years, people have, have, have complained, honestly, about there being, where did the spring go? Where did the fall go? In so many locations. And there is some truth to that. You know, the seasons are definitely different. We were talking about it last night as well. Western Canada bypasses fall and skips straight to winter. Here you go. Same thing again. British Columbia, Central Alberta, preparing to jump straight into winter as they are issuing brutal snowfall warnings. Meteorologists say a cold front will plunge southward out of the Northwest Territories, bringing unseasonably cold temperatures to re regions within both provinces. Welcome to the Grand Solar Minimum. But the big question is what's causing the Grand Solar Minimum? Is it just a regular cycle? Well, even if it is a regular cycle, what causes the cycle? Japan, cold weather hits Hokkaido, earthquake evacuees. A sudden drop in temperatures taking its toll on evacuees following the deadly 6.7 magnitude earthquake in Hokkaido that caused massive landslides that killed 44. Over 2,000 people still in temporary shelters, 6,000 homes cut off from power and water, and at Suma alone, the mercury plunging to 5.4 degrees Celsius has put the health of local residents at risk. As again, we are heading straight into winter from summer. And we've been tracking this. Let's take a peek. And so this is the Arctic sea ice levels. And as I've been sharing with you guys, and I have to wonder if like my last video seems like it's been put into netherland because like the two previous before it got 21,000 views and 24,000 views and it got like 2,000 views which i know isn't the case um but yet that's what it's reading there's something wrong going on there and i wonder you know is it have to do with pointing this out and this could be nothing at all except for the fact that the grand solar minimum people are thinking that this current line is going to trend up here and, and we're going to see a tremendous increase in Arctic sea ice volume as a natural uh, effect of the Grand Solar Minimum. It hasn't happened yet. The line is starting to trail, starting to curve. But it's actually dipped down, where if we looked before, you had this year running more Arctic ice back in June up to July than any other year going back to 2004. But then it dipped down as things warmed up and you have 2014 running ahead of it with more Arctic ice. And then it passed down below the 2004-2013 uh, average. And now it's about to cross over underneath the 2015 average and you have the 2017 right there as well. So depending on how this line goes, it might not be building at the rates that the experts thought. So does that mean we're not in a grand solar minimum? Or is it pointing out something else? You know, is there the possibility in the, that we are, for one, we are in a pole shift. We do know that. And that's a huge player in everything that's going on. Could it be that, you know, the Arctic, again, and I touched on this yesterday's video, is not going to be the location of the North Pole? As we know, the magnetic North Pole has been wandering. Many are worried about crustal displacement, where the, the actual crust is shifting. Uh, you know, shifting, literally shifting. There have been so many people making observations saying, you know, the sun is, is setting too far north. It's not setting westward anymore. And of course, there's seasonal variance. But again, I just got to bring this up because I do feel there is crustal displacement and that's part of the reason why it's dangerous to live on coastlines. Uh, not that you're necessarily safe anywhere with the flooding that we see and everything that we see. But still, this makes me wonder and I'm very, very curious to see where this cuts through and where it ends up going up. And you know, it very might well be that it might turn the corner and start to go up and ends up breaking all these records as far as volume 
But if it doesn't, and we do feel like things are definitely getting colder, then you have to wonder, I would just wonder if there is really some crustal displacement going on and is the pole shift proceeding at an exponential rate, which there's definitely indications of that. And what is causing all this? Is it that planetary body that so many people have seen? And before I forget about it, let me bring up this photo for you guys. And this was sent in by another viewer. And this is over Oklahoma City. This was actually a photo taken of by the mayor of Oklahoma City. And some will say, well, that's just uh, a lens flare. You know, it's got to be a lens flare. But do you know how many of these photos we've seen? And when we watched the video that was in the other uh, video I did about three days ago, four days ago, her camera moves and you see double lens flares indicating two sources of light that are moving. You know, so is there a second sun? What is this? If it's if it is not a lens flare, what is it? Is it red kachina? You know, it, the Hopi have been waiting for blue and red kachina. You know, in the Bible we have wormwood. There is Mother Shipton's, you know, the dragon. There's there's all these indications and all these mythologies, and there, there's many, many, many of them, more than just those that I mentioned, that talk about other bodies, planetary and stellar bodies, that come into view in what we call the end times, or the tribulation period, if, if you want to look at it from a biblical point of view. So is this really the bigger picture? You know, are they giving us the grand solar minimum to just keep us a little bit distracted or to give us something to say, hey, oh, well, that's what it is. It's just grand solar minimum where the grand solar minimum is part of it. But the bigger picture is the fact that these bodies, which are going to cause tremendous impact upon the Earth because of their electromagnetic influence. So, you know, watch everybody closely, know people's backgrounds, know who's worked for, for government agencies, and I would always listen to them with uh, taking a grain of salt as to if there's any agenda there or not. Because you know they're going to keep us in the dark officially until the very last moment. Here's why there are hundreds of ancient mummified penguins in Antarctica, and this shows you how quickly things can change. This is a 750-year-old graveyard of mummified penguins. And penguins could take cold, obviously. Look where they live, <laughs> right? And so there's so many bodies of these penguins. There's no signs of any sort of illness. There's no signs of any sort of massacre by predators. These penguins were all mummified by the cold, dry Antarctic environment. They likely died from weather on the opposite end of the spectrum. Two extremely rainy and snowy events that happened over the past thousand years is likely what did them in. And it did them in so quickly they couldn't they they couldn't do anything about it. And they ended up mummified. Remember the movie The Day After Tomorrow? Uh, things can change pretty quick. That was a little bit of an over-dramatization. Over but still, things do change very quick. Think of the flash flooding in areas that, okay, normally, yeah, maybe it gets to be, you know, 6 to 12 inches of water under that, you know, uh, railroad underpass. Now, all of a sudden, it's 5 feet deep. And people are drowning on Main Street, USA different times and things can happen so quickly it's very rare to find so many mummified penguins especially mummified chicks and yet here they are so it's very interesting you know it's, it's just one of those things we were talking about the woolly mammoths you know still frozen with their last meal and them things can happen very quickly so do you know bats can be beneficial do you want to have a bat house? Should you have a bat house on your property? And no, I don't have bats in my belfry, at least not that I'm aware of. Uh, but this topic actually came up um, about a week ago. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, it, it is actually something that's to be cultivated because, you know, bats can be very beneficial. They, they actually have some 
good attributes to them. So why would you want bats in, in, their, in your yard? So among their many positive qualities, the top three are their excellent pollinating abilities, their beneficial guano, and the fact that they eat mosquitoes by the thousands a day. Just one bat can eat up to a thousand mosquitoes an hour. That's, that's a lot of eating. Those, those things can really put it down. That could definitely be beneficial, especially if you're you know, out in the woods, if you're on your homestead, if you're at your bug out place, you're out in the country, or even if you're not out in the country and just out in your own suburban backyard that tends to get a lot of mosquitoes. So when it comes to building your own bat house, there are a few key things to keep in mind, regardless of the size and the, sh and the style of the house you choose to make it. Contrary to what you may have heard or even seen, it's a good idea to keep bat houses off of your actual house if you don't want them to make their way inside. So as much as you may be bat friendly, your guests, your house guests may find it disconcerting to hear them crawling inside your walls. You'll also have better luck with bat occupancy if your bat house is near the top of an outbuilding or on a pole rather than in a tree. Another key thing to keep in mind is that your wood should never be treated with chemicals. This is key when using reclaimed wood especially. Always be certain that the wood is in its natural state. You can use plywood. However, you're better off using a wood like cedar that will hold up better over time. And here you see a fine example of a bat house. <laughs> Very cute. Because bats prefer warmer temperatures, 80 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, put your bat house in an area with a lot of sun exposure where the house internal temperature will rise. Also, you want to hang it at least 15 feet high so it's out of the range of predators and ideally close enough to a fresh water so source so that mothers don't have to leave their babies for too long. When considering which color to paint your bat house, it's best not to choose something trendy or whimsical. There's a good reason for avoiding personal preference in this case because bats prefer warmer temperatures depending on where you live. The color of the house should ideally be one that helps to retain heat. Further up north you, you live, the darker your bat house should be. For those in North America, there's a map here that you could click, click on uh, that will be helpful in telling you what colors are best. And then um, basically there's some, some plans here for you as well. And uh, you could be on your way to having your own bat house and maybe your neighbors will start calling you Batman or Batwoman or Batgirl. So I just thought that was an interesting thing because that might be something that you would not even think about. But yet, they could be so beneficial. And as you can see, there's some plans in here for you guys to check out. So my friends, as always, please do thumbs up to support the channel. Make sure you are subscribed and click on the bell for all the notifications. Uh, go ahead and share with as many people as possible so we can wake them up to what's happening. Keep people safe as much as possible. May you guys be blessed with abundant peace, love, health, well-being, and all good things. And always be kept safe in these times. God bless and namaste, my friends.